Hello everyone and welcome to the 2016 Glassblown Open. I'm your host Terry Miller, the Disc Golf Guy, joined here by Dixon Jowers, the end-all be-all at Dynamic Disc, aren't you? Is there? I was looking for a title um, earlier. Is there yeah. anything you don't do? I'm, I mean, I'm not paid like that, but, <laughs> but yeah, sure you can call me that. I bet a lot of people would disagree, but I'm fine with it. Multi-talented. He was also covering the lead card last year. We're glad he could step inside the Smashbox for our live coverage this year. Dixon, talk a little bit about the event. What's going on out here this week? Uh, it's going to be fantastic. We had some really bad weather a couple days ago, but today we've got 65 degrees, sunny, slight wind. I think the scoring conditions are going to be great out here on a slightly shorter course. I think we should see some great golf today. And now we're going to be talking about that throughout the broadcast, a little bit how the course has changed, and we'll mm -hmm. give you kind of hole by hole where there's some differences. Overall, there's ultimately six differences. Is yes, that what you'd three, say? three pin position changes, and then there's three entirely new holes that these guys have probably not practiced. All right. Well, we've got an introduction to coming to you from Dynamic Disc. We'll be back after that with our tee shots. Just a few moments here, Dixon. We're going to have Paul Macbeth. This card is comprised of some pretty substantial players here at the event. How did this card come about? Uh, well, we always do for the lead card of the first round of uh, former champions of the Glassblown Open. Um, so this year, uh, as always, we'll have a fantastic group. Paul Macbeth, Will Schustrick, Simon Lazat, and Kayla Leviska. Actually, before last year, or before this year, Paul wouldn't have been able to be on this card because he hadn't won until last year. So. We're glad that uh, that this group right here is, is going to be able to do it. Um, and the, the chase card is actually a fantastic card as well. So there's some amazing golfers here in town. Um, that's, what, that's what I love about being a part of the NTs is, is we get to throw the tournament, and then we get to see the best guys in the world come to our course and play. Well, we are excited. This is a different course than we've seen here. Last year we were at the municipal course, and here we're at the Peter Pan course. First on the tee from Huntington Beach, California, Paul McBeth. And that carries over the basket. Macbeth throwing one of his more stable Star Destroyers. Yeah, he had a real good angle on that when it was uh, first making its turn. But he caught a little bit of a wind on the hyzer spot, put him left to the basket. Simon looked like he made the correction, put it a little further right, and so that Thank win that pushed Paul team left team pushed Simon right to the basket. Street. Will stepping up with his four.
from St. Paul, Minnesota, Kel Ibiska. Both on the entry and exit of that field, Kale just barely clearing the OB fence. Yeah, that's really the main danger of this hole. Um, this is a new tee pad from uh, this hole in previous years. It makes the hyzer over the top of the baseball field uh, the much more desirable route. However, if you take that route and don't clear, you are setting yourself up for a five almost immediately. You're going to have a really long turnover shot through some trees to try to get up and down. Uh, Kale going with the same disc as Will, a uh, slightly different color. He had an orange 400 GD1. Wills was looking really good coming in, but he caught the edge of that hedgerow right there. So he's going to be just outside the circle and maybe have a foot in the bushes. Um, so it looks like uh, Simon's going to get a CTP on this first hole. We'll have to see as we traverse the course as to if the sogginess that's out here, as you mentioned earlier, some crazy weather has come in in the last few days. It's also altered the layout of the course. We'll see if any of the longer grass or somewhat muddy terrain will impact these players or their shots. Yeah, we should be clear of the mud for the first few holes. This is going to be mainly the grassy section of the park. And most of the dew has dried off or been walked off by the other players. So they should be fine for the first few holes here. We've got a pretty substantial gallery walking with us, uh, much larger than I was probably expecting for a uh, first day of a tournament. Um, and there's quite a crowd following the chase card as well. Um, players are trying to determine who's out, and it looks like they're going to go with Kale. It's going to have about 55 feet or so with a left to right wind as he's standing. Just catching that slight right side of the chains. Kale's going to be sitting next to the pin and taking a three here. Shoestrick and Macbeth determining which one of them's out. Looks like it's going to be Shoestrick. Yeah, Will putts with a PA3. Uh, he's going slight, um, yeah, probably five to ten mile an hour headwind. It's going to be moving a little bit left to right for him. So if he's going to try to throw an Anheuser putt here to get around the edge of this bush, he's going to have to watch for the lift from the wind. Shoestrick with somewhat, not only the obstruction, but you could tell he actually had to alter his release there from what you typically see from him. Paul from the circle's edge front cages it so none of the first three guys were able to get a deuce on this a uh, little bit of a tweener hole this isn't a gimme deuce by any chance but it's something that these guys should all expect simon now stepping up for about 12 feet to clean up and simon in for the lone birdie As we watch the rest of the group tap in for their threes, we move over behind hole two's tee pad. We can give you a preview of what that looks like right here at Peter Pan Park. Hole two plays slightly uphill towards the basket. A strong thrower can take a hard low line straight at the basket through the trees, though getting the disc much higher than eight feet will put it on the ground pretty quickly. 
Some players opt for the high right to left shot off the tee, but shots that fall short often end up on the opposite side of the divider bush that extends the length of the hole, leaving them with a blind upshot. And it looks as if the players are standing down here on hole number two. You want to make sure that they're not disrupting another group. There's a group just directly behind us on hole number four's tee. Behind us here on hole number four is Drew Gibson. Drew, a recent addition to the Dynamic Disc team and lineup. Yeah, it looked like he hit a pretty good shot there. Um, uh, we, we do have a backup here on our first hole. However, this is a group teeing off on hole four that these tee boxes are just close to each other. So after this, it should be smooth sailing for quite a while. Towering big germ lining up with a forehand shot. Oh, he's giving it an ace run. He's giving it an ace run. Oh, and he skips short, does an anti skip, and hits the cage, lays down for a two foot birdie putt on a pretty difficult hole. is blue FD3 straight up the middle. There is a big hyzer line on this hole, but you're adding about 80 feet, 100 feet if you want to do that. And just to the right of the pin is Paul Macbeth's champion Thunderbird. Yeah, he, he slipped through the edges of that pine tree. And the, that, that tree is known to stop a lot of birdie runs. And Will Let's Go Early hits a guardian tree. He's going to have about 250 to go. Should be a pretty open angle, uh, but not what he was looking for here. And Kale with a pure shot. Nice looking shot. I believe that was his uh, 400 GD3. The, the basket here, it seems like a pretty straightforward shot, 348 feet. However, it is just a touch uphill, and the trees pinch in just enough to make you think about it. Um, Kale, I'm pretty sure, is going to have the CTP there. It actually made me think uh, where Paul's landed that he might have actually gone a little bit long and be putting back at the basket. These first two holes out here at Pan are gettable, um, but you don't feel like your round is ruined if you, get, uh, if you miss the birdies on these. 
Um, this is one that kind of the kind of the bonus birdie holes on the course. We'll go in with a PA three approach, sitting right around two hundred feet. Needs to get up. Oh, he leaves that about 40 or 50 short, trying to stay under the limbs of the first couple of trees that he had to deal with. He didn't quite give it enough juice to glide out. One thing to note there is many of your top players you'll see throwing with a standstill approach. Anytime they're under approximately 250 to 200 feet, they'll frequently just stand there, shift their weight, and give a smooth release. <laughs> Yeah, the reason I do that is uh, basically it's just less moving parts. If I don't have to think about my feet or perform a next step or anything, it can really just help with my uh, concentrating on my form, my upper body, a clean, uh, clean arm angle, clean release. And then also uh, it, it can really help me get a turn. I can have a much more powerful snap and it allows me to do some things with the disc. Simon Lazat will be first to putt. The wind may have carried that left on him just a little bit. Well, now from right at the circle's edge, he was a touch closer than I could see. Let's see if he can clean this up. And Will, what a great save on hole three. Uh, some distraction there in the background. Peter Pan sits right in the middle of a neighborhood. Uh, you're going to have a lot more kind of neighborhood distractions here than you will at the other two courses. Dogs barking, cars driving by, hearing kids play. Um, the local train tracks are not too far away. So if the train's coming through, you'll hear a, a, a big horn. Uh, yeah, Paul looks like he has gone to the um, circle's edge on the backside. He is high off the flag. Looks like that wind that we just saw by Simon Lazat may have also got Paul lifted as he was putting into that headwind, although it was very slight. Yeah, you could see after Paul putted, he, uh, he picked up some grass and checked the wind again. So whatever it was doing was not what he was expecting to happen. And Kale now with less than 10 feet. What a fantastic drive. Easy birdies are always good. Of course, Macbeth tapping in with his McPro AVR. That is two holes complete here at Peter Pan. Stand down for just a moment. We'll give you a whole preview of hole number three. Hole three plays 350. The center of the fairway is relatively open, though with a bit of a low ceiling. The difficult part of the hole comes in the squeezing between that ceiling and the rising elevation to the basket that sits on a slightly raised green. Shots that get caught early will leave players with a challenging putt. Shots that cover the distance but don't land smoothly risk skipping out of bounds on the patio behind the basket. So this is a new pin position on uh, traditional hole three at Peter Pan. It used to be a turnover shot or a, a small hyzer skip. 
Now it is up on the top of the hill, back in the sunlight. Uh, you need to carry about 330 feet and then get a little skip at the end. Kale leaves it too far out to the right with his H1. Lazat throwing a stable PD2. And that's the that's the limb you need to stay under. He was going right towards the basket. Uh, kicked him down. He should be just outside the circle's edge. Uh, depends on how far he went into that bush on whether his um, his throw is going to be um, obstructed at all. I had McBath with a misfire here. That is hysering left. Looks as if he has missed his line or released a little early. Will go in with his X1, super stable distance driver, and he's that's a skip. There you go, perfect. Will be at about 20 feet. That's exactly what you're looking to do on this hole. If you hit that upslope with a flat shot, it's not going to go anywhere. You got to hit it with some angle and some speed to get it up there to putt. So Paul having a slow start here. Um, he is last year's champion, as we said. He actually averaged 10.67 for his uh, tournament last year. Uh, he's going to really need to turn it on here for the remaining holes if he's going to try to put that sort of average together again. Now, Dixon, I know that we're out here on a modified layout today due to the weather we discussed earlier. Even with the changes, what are you expecting to be solid scores found out here on this course today? Well, we were discussing it earlier. It's it's a little bit difficult because uh, the course went through some changes that made it about four strokes harder, uh, not but about six weeks ago in preparation for this. And several of those changes are now not in play. Um, so uh, I know I've heard some, uh, some 49s coming in already this morning. I know Katrina had the hot round in the FPO group with a 55. Um, I would think if one of these guys really gets on fire, they could maybe get to the mid 40s. Um, but I, I, I would I would be surprised if there's anybody in double digits under par. And speaking of par, oh, Kale, just off. But speaking of par, what exactly is par on the course today with this layout? Uh, 56 to a 57. Um, it uh, it kind of depends on how you classify uh, the 14th hole that we're going to play. But there are definitely two par fours, maybe three on the course. Nick Beth dealing with some bushes. He's going to have to modify his putt here. Just short and left. I was actually fully expecting him to make that because he was goofing off on the practice green, uh, throwing a shot almost exactly like that through the V in a tree that was right by the practice basket, and he, he went two for two. Simon from about 25, trying to figure out what kind of swing to take here. And with the horseshoe putt, which you rarely see, how many times have you seen that in actual competition, Dixon? Uh, I'm pretty sure that makes one. And just taking two strokes to complete our third hole is Will Schusterek. Or at least I've only seen Simon do it once. I guess there are some other putters. Nico, you could say that's kind of a horseshoe putt. Um, but yeah, he was having some trouble there figuring out how best to, to get at that. I thought we were going to have a, a Simon trick shot video right during the middle of the round. And Kale with his second birdie in three holes. Oh, correction, I apologize. That was, in fact, a par. 
Yeah, so far, only one person has birdied each hole. Simon got the first, Kale got the second, Will got the third. We'll see if Paul can get the fourth and even everything up on this card. So this is one of the par fours that the course had. However, the long basket on this hole is completely underwater this morning when we started. So we actually moved it to the short position. Um, so this changes uh, this par four into a par three. It actually took a little over 200 feet off of the hole from 578 down to 365. We do have a hole preview, so you guys can view that. And as they fly over what looked to be the short pin, you can note that's the pin they're playing to this round. Hole four leads the players into the woods Peter Pan is known for. 250 feet of open space off the tee catches some players with a small rise in elevation, but most of the trouble comes as the pole begins to tunnel through the trees. Players must play between the brush to the left and right and pass the short pin to a mulchy green slightly out to the right. The green is on a small peninsula, but the creeks that make it don't often come into play. Shoe strike first to tee. We're going with a roller on this hole. Seemed to lay it down really well, but that is an interesting choice. The other change on this hole, there was a casual ditch running the entire left side. Um, now down by the basket, uh, that some of that ditch is playing as OB because of the elevated water. I was looking for that to hook up at the end of the flight. Yeah, that was that was his M4, 400 G M4, and it just looked like it held that uh, it held that flat. Simon now trying the third different theory on this hole with a flick. A forehand with his PD2. Yeah, he got up a little high, but he was able to fight through the trees. I don't think he quite got to the circle's edge, though, uh, because of the tree. Took some steam off there. Looks like Paul's going with the same shot. And Paul, with one of his more neutral Star Destroyers, hits a tree and now it's rolling back. Yeah, he caught some limbs, shot them down into a trunk, and then he caught the downslope. It is heading towards that ditch. However, he is short enough that even if he made it down to the ditch, that would be the casual portion of that. So right here is where we're going to start getting into some of the sloppiness that is uh, that came from the rising Cottonwood Falls River here. Uh, actually, holes number five and six on the traditional Peter Pan course uh, were completely taken out of play this morning um, because of because of those waters. The tee sign for the short tee box on hole five, which is the drop zone for our hole five, the water was actually all the way up to the level of the sign, so it was about three feet deep right there. Not exactly the best footing. Yesterday, as we were previewing the course, it was actually in terms of water receding. Instead, it was rising. Now, is it true there was a dam nearby or something, a reservoir of sorts that maybe was helping feed that? Yeah, if I, if I understand right, there's a lake upstream. And so until they get that lake at the right level, they're going to continue to drop water. And until they get it to the right spot, it will keep rising. Apparently, it got to the right, the right spot last night around midnight. Paul did, in fact, roll all the way down the hill and into that ditch. So he is going to have a very obstructed shot. He's going to be about 150. It is casual. Um, they're trying to figure out how best to mark it because he is right on the edge of the water. He's going to have about 
20 or 30 feet worth of pretty tight trees to deal with in order to get back into the open. This is going to take every bit of uh, his rating to get this shot up and down to save the par. Paul's grabbed two different discs. Looks like he has both a putter and his Nova in his hands. Frequently see Paul throwing a Nova for any of his more straight shots. He's going to make sure that he's got proper footing down here. And Paul asking not to hit the tree, and he's going to leave himself quite a bit short here. He's looking at a bogey. Yeah, the angle coming out, he was uh, he had to bust it out of there in order to avoid those limbs right in front, and he just left it a little wide. Now, Kale's going to have the, the opposite problem that Paul had. He is going to be into bushes uh, pretty much up to his neck. He's looking like he's trying to figure out a pancake shot. Uh, the problem with this shot is that he is now throwing downhill on a uh, hard packed dirt slash mud that if it gets slippery at all he's going to slide right down and by the basket that is the ob section so if he goes flying over this basket or sliding past he's looking at adding a circle to a score that seems to have just the right amount of power and looks like a little tree assist yeah, it's it's always good when that helps out. Uh, I'd rather be lucky than good. And in order to hit that tree, you had to be good to get out and then got a little lucky afterwards. And what a tough pot. He's looking at an Anheuser around the tree with a little bit of a tailwind. That's a, a very difficult putt to execute. Yeah, and there was a bunch of roots by his feet. Uh, it's 60 something feet or so. It was a, uh, that, was, that was a tough ask even for Simon. Will now from just inside of the creek, the, the casual creek spot of this hole. He's going to have about the same distance as Simon, uh, although he's going slightly uphill, and he's going to have to take a straddle stance probably because of the creek right behind him. And as you said, some uneven footing there may have adjusted his stance. It's going to be Macbeth trying to save his par. Yeah, this From about 55, Paul gives it a run to save his par. He catches the front metal and rolls down the hill. That was actually heading right towards the OB Creek, but curled up. Now he's got about 20, and he looks to be hot right now. And he cleans up on his four. He, it revealed to us last night in the uh, pro panel that he actually enjoys playing while frustrated. So he's going to get his opportunity now being one over after the first four. And clean up here by Schusterick and speaking further to the point about Paul Macbeth, he was bested last weekend by the German, Simon Lazat. They had moved into a playoff, a three-way tie, along with their good traveling friend, Nate Sexton. And Lazat came out on top. We're here, we're through four. We're going to take a brief walk over to hole number five, sit back and enjoy. Hole 5 makes the player send an accurate shot through a small window over the OB Creek. Due to the proximity of the creek, players won't just worry about being knocked down by the trees, but being kicked OB in the process. 
the creek continues to follow the right side of the hole and the green sits in a circle of trees that can block shots even within the circle. While the hole is relatively flat, the combination of low ceiling, tight shooting, and potential OB can make five more interesting than it might first appear. We knew there was a couple of holes that would not be in play. So this is actually a transition hole walking to uh, our next one. It's right at just under 300 feet, 294 feet. There is a mando tree on the right hand side, but that's really only uh, there to protect some uh, park benches and a playground that's right there. There's kind of two ways to approach this shot. The wider gap off of the box is for a forehand or a lefty shot or a turnover for a righty. However, there is a guardian tree about 40 feet short. The other route is going to be a flat, straight power shot because it's going to need to carry that entire distance while not getting more than about 15 feet high. Well, while we are here, even with the slight adjustment, of course, we'd like to thank our whole sponsor, Larry Holland. It's getting a little extra love here today with a different look at this hole. We're well, going with this A1 here. He had a real good angle on it, but he has stayed out wide and left. Uh, he might be about pin high. It's kind of tough for me to tell, uh, but if he is, he's right on the circle's edge. And kill now with his M4, 400G. I think he's going for the flat straight shot. Oh, and I thought he was past that limb. He catches it and falls straight down. He's going to have every bit of 200, but it'll be wide open uh, to approach that basket. And after contemplation, Simon goes with the forehand on his PD2. He also had an MD3 mid-range lined up. This is Macbeth with one of his stable Star Destroyers. Yeah, Simon should be just inside the circle there. Good shot avoiding that uh, Guardian tree. Well, the crowd is oohing and eyeing, but I think he's a little bit deep there. Uh, that came out with a lot of steam, maybe left over from hole four. I think he's probably going to have at least circle's edge coming back to the basket. Yeah, after we play this hole, uh, the kind of the flow of the course is going to change. Um, so uh, if you're used to Peter Pan, you're going to see some new stuff out here. Our PDGA media manager, Marty Gregoire, just letting all of our amazing spectators out here know that they need to give all the players a little bit of time and space. We have a lot of excitement out here, a lot of people coming out to take in the action live. However, we want to make sure it's little disruption to our players. Yeah, who's this guy think he is, bossing people around? Oh, that's his job. Never mind. I'd like to send a huge shout out to all of the amazing Dynamic Disc team members, employees, and everyone and beyond and support staff here coming out making adjustments as early as this morning, as you said earlier, Dixon. Just a real testament to the hard work and efforts you guys are putting in this week.
And Paul cans that circle's edge putt. And rarely do you say Macbeth takes a birdie to get him back to even. Will now from about the same distance. No real wind to speak of right now. And just before Will Schusterick released, I was thinking has he has somewhat modified his putt. Looks as if his pullback or release is a slightly different position. And Simon cans the 22 footer or so to get his second birdie on the card. Uh, and yes, you did hear me right earlier. There was no real wind to speak of. We are still in Emporia, Kansas, and there was no wind, at least for one putt. And Kale getting slippery right through the chains, but the back nub catches him, and he stays in for his birdie, or excuse me, that's his par save three. Schusterick in for his three as we hear a train passing by and just a few moments ago you mentioned that there was no wind out here which is obviously rare in Emporia, Kansas. I think anywhere in Kansas. What I would like to remind everyone out there, our players, spectators, viewers, everyone alike, if you have what we consider a GBO moment, any kind of moment worth noting, please go out and use the hashtag, hashtag GBO moment. Make sure you tag us. That may classify as our first GBO moment, a winless putt out here in Emporia, Kansas. Yeah, it's this time of year, it's, uh, it's especially uh, windy. I actually uh, moved here a couple of years ago, uh, right at the beginning of August. And for about the first five weeks I was here, every day it was like 75 degrees, sunny, no clouds, no wind. And I thought I had moved to paradise. So we just had to marshal right through. Uh, one of the changes that we had to make for today, with five and six being pulled out, that hole we just played was one of the replacement holes. The other replacement hole is uh, what actually is traditionally a hole on this course for a tournament that Dynamic Disc runs called the Monkey Island Open. Uh, it, there, so there is a normal tee pad, there's a normal pin position. Um, this hole, so there is a a strange stone structure that is surrounded by uh, about a two or three foot tall rock wall. And uh, in the same way that uh, you hear stories about your hometown or your old high school or whatever, I don't know how accurate this story is, but what I've always heard is that this used to be the uh, monkey house of the old zoo here in Emporia. Um, there's a, this weird structure kind of standing in the middle of a bean shaped uh, island. And so it is going to play as a true island hole. Players are going to have to carry right at 300 feet to get into the island and then another probably 60 or 70 feet to the basket. The, uh, the hard part about this hole is that there is um, there's some, some foliage and, a, and especially a, a large uh, bush that is covering up from the player's perspective most of the island so they're throwing somewhat of a blind shot basically what they aim at is a an electric pole that is kind of hanging out in the middle of the park so you want to aim and try to hit that pole but then not actually hit that pole obviously because you land OB uh, this is a hole where there can be some uh, some big swings um, pretty much if you if you make the island you're probably have a circle putter closer 
Um, but if you miss, from then you have a drop zone shot from a little over 200. You can start getting a little nervous. Yeah, as you mentioned, this hole is actually not something they were able to practice previously, as this is a transitional hole that was implemented just this morning, so our players may not have any practice out here. Well, that last like should be straightforward for them, though. That last hole that we just played, uh, I would say uh, almost certainly 0% of the open field had practiced that hole. This hole has actually been in play in several tournaments, and a lot of times when people are playing casual rounds out here, they just throw to the island because it's kind of a fun shot. So um, a, lot of the, a lot of the MPO players may have actually thrown this hole uh, just while they were warming up earlier this week, or if they've played a tournament here previously, they would have thrown this. Lizotte lining up with a PD-2. And Lazat gets a green flag here by the spotter. Yeah, th this is that. Uh, it looked like from the box that, that was way left. Um, yeah, Simon just walked back, said he didn't know what to do because he hadn't played this hole. Um, he has made the island, but I bet he's every bit of sixty or seventy short. And Macbeth with a pink champion monster here. He's also getting a green flag. That's a new addition to his bag this year. Yeah, I bet he's. Uh, I bet he's um, in the circle or in the island, probably pin high. Um, but I bet he's a little bit right. You need to throw it a lot more left than you think you do. Um, it's kind of scary throwing to the part of an island that you can't see. Will, I believe that was his A3. That's a little bit left of Paul, so he's going to be a little bit closer. I think he had the distance just about right. There is a power wire that comes across uh, the throwing zone here that I have seen some pretty nasty ricochets off of. And Kale is in safe. I, actually, right after I said that last sentence, I thought, oh, man, I hope I didn't just jinx him that he would hit that wire. But he goes high and safe. Uh, Will, I believe, is the closest one to the basket. And I'm, I'm guessing probably the only one inside the circle. It's just a little bit further and a little bit lefter than you think when you're standing on the box. Now, after they complete this hole, we will actually backtrack to the next tee. Is that correct, Nixon? Yeah, we'll go to what is um, in the caddy books and online and even the hole previews, what is hole number eight, even though it'll technically be the seventh hole that these guys are playing. Somewhere I'm going to get lost out here today. I'm here for you, buddy. See, it's a good thing Johnny V put a rope in between us, so if one of us falls, the other one can pick you up. So Simon right there showed... Um, I think he just made a professional decision. He didn't really know what to do. He hadn't played this hole before, so he played safe. Um, he threw a spike, got in the island, and he'll take his about 50 or 60 foot putt, and, and he'll walk away with a two or a three. Um, sometimes people really get onto Simon and say that you know he plays too aggressive, and um, you know he doesn't he doesn't really play smart sometimes. But uh, he did a really good job there of just um, you know managing the course well. You're not going to lose this tournament if you get a three here instead of a two. Um, but if you miss the island and you end up with a, a five or something like that, that can really throw you off your game. Simon with just outside 50 feet. And just a bit short on that attempt. Actually... Paul, Will, and Kale are all quite a bit closer than I thought. Paul in for his second birdie in a row, second on the card from about 20 feet. Will and Kale look like they're both about uh, 15 feet or closer. And 
and talking about top level professionals here again all four of them essentially playing the hole for the first time or somewhat blind this morning we see Paul will and kale all within 20 feet of the pin shows that they've got the skills they just need to go out and execute Well, this goes back to what they were saying last night at the pro panel is that they don't really keep score. They're not out really trying to practice individual holes. They're trying to master shots. And so they can go to their vault here and know, okay, I need to throw a 350 foot hyzer and I've got 60 feet worth of space to do it. And then they can just go execute based on their thousands of practice shots. That's a lesson for you kids at home about how important practice is. And Simon taps in. We have just completed our seventh hole of the round. We're going to stand down for just a few moments. Sit back and enjoy. This is a word from our sponsor, Dynamic Discs. Disc golf is a sport growing in popularity all over the United States and around the world. Dynamic Discs is the premier disc golf manufacturer, distributor, and retailer for enthusiasts, beginners, experts, and hardcore players. Along with hosting some of the best professional disc golf association tournaments in the country, Dynamic Discs also takes pride in offering the best customer service in the disc golf industry. At Dynamic Discs, customer service isn't just a department, it's the way we do business. Our entire staff at Dynamic Discs is knowledgeable and passionate about growing the sport and providing you with an exceptional experience. We know how important it is to get the products that you order in your hands as quickly as possible. Orders are shipped immediately from our own inventory and arrive at your doorstep in two to three days to almost any location around the United States. Check us out at dynamicdiscs.com. How would you like to raise awareness for disc golf in your area, as well as make a little bit of money? We would like to invite you to participate in the Trilogy Challenge 2016. The Trilogy Challenge is a series of events that takes place all over the world. This year, it's going to be between May the 28th and September the 18th. We're going to provide you as the tournament director with everything that you need to pull off a great event, as well as make your players extremely happy. If you let us know the dates of your events at TrilogyChallenge.com, we will post it on our website. And then about three weeks before your event, we will send you a link where you can order the correct number of players packs with a minimum of 25 being required. As well as the players packs getting shipped out to you, we will also give you prizes for the winners as well as a Trilogy Challenge banner that you can hang at your tournament headquarters. If you go to TrilogyChallenge.com, you can also download flyers that can be posted at your course or your local shop as well as Trilogy branded images that you can post on social media. This year, as an added bonus, if you have over 100 players at your event, we will throw in a Dynamic Disc Marksman basket absolutely free so that you can give as a grand prize to your winner. If you go to TrilogyChallenge.com, you can see the requirements that go along with this particular offer. One thing that tournament directors are usually worried about is that they would order too many players packs. However, if that's a concern of yours this year, we've taken that away from you. If you have more than 10 players packs, we will buy them back from you if you let us know within seven days after the end of the event. We don't want you to be concerned about that. If you go to TrilogyChallenge.com, you can get the answers to all of the questions that you have and register your event. We look forward to you being a part of it again this year. So you've just walked into a disc golf store. Look at all that sweet plastic. So many new discs to try. But you have your trusty compadres. Why would you want to try something new? What if you don't like this new disc? Rest easy when shopping at any of our buyback retailers. If you are not completely satisfied with a disc from Dynamic Discs, Latitude 64, or Westside Discs, bring it back within 14 days with proof of purchase and we will replace it with whatever disc you want. It is that simple. Now get out there and play some disc golf. Check out dynamicdiscs.com slash retail to find a buyback retail partner near you.
And Dixon, we've caught up with our card here. We have Drew Gibson throwing the over-the-top shot. We also just saw a similar shot. Yeah, that is a very powerful shot to be able to do that. Um, They're putting it up into a head crosswind and still getting great distance. Yeah, generally the way that we've been playing this hole is um, that same tree that they're going over, we were throwing low skip shots almost. This is a par four. Now I want to see this. I've heard rumor that Nate Sexton parked this hole twice with a roller, a cut roller basically, during practice rounds. Yeah, and there, oh, the wind is pushing him left. He needs to curl on that. And he has come back in. That's a good spot to be. I believe that was an S-line PD2 by Nate Sexton, playing very aggressive here, as he's known for. Yeah, this is a um, this is a extremely difficult hole. When I heard rumors that he was uh, that he parked it back to back with that shot, I mean, basically all you can say is. Well, that's a shot that should be rated like 1080. Um, he's trying to throw a cut roller. He's landing it 100 feet to the right of the basket, then trying to get it to run downhill through some trees, cover about 450 feet, and then curl back up to the right and then not go to the road. Um, so if, <laughs> if he can do that consistently, I guess that's why he makes a living playing disc golf, and I make a living talking about disc golf. Uh, because I cannot do that shot. Um, so a treat here for everyone as we catch up to the second card. You're talking about Ricky Wysocki, along with Big Germ, Jeremy Colling, Andrew Gibson, all some of the furthest throwing players in the game. And Nate Sexton, of course, has big distance as well. But these other three throw as far as they can. Drew Gibson giving me the nod, indicating that he is, in fact, the furthest throwing player on the card. Is that, is that correct, Drew? Probably, actually, yeah. He says, probably, actually, yeah. <laughs> Drew's never one to be short on confidence. So, Germ now doing what germ does oh my goodness so his drive got caught up on a on a side tree dropped him straight down he lost all of his distance on his drive he had about uh, probably just a little short of 400 feet to go through a gap and he threw a laser beam flick that landed about 20 feet short and skipped right towards the basket but it jumped right over the top of the flag so he's going to have probably circles edge putt back but a fantastic shot to even be thinking about a three on this hole from where he was after his drive Dixon, we've seen Big Germ throw two shots essentially here, and both of them have nearly skipped into the basket. I think he's got one dialed in some point today. Ricky with the flick up shot. Looks like he should be about where Germ is. Looks like he was going with a, uh, a mid range disc there, maybe a putter. Uh, Drew and Ricky were much closer than Germ was off the box because they, they at least got to where they were going clean. Drew is stymied here a little bit. You, on this, if you throw that hyzer or the skip shot low on your drive, you really want to get to the left side of these trees that, uh, that Drew's having to deal with now. If you can get to the left of them, you have a wide open alley, 70 or 80 feet across, um, and a pretty straight shot for about 230 feet. Drew now has that same distance, but he's going to have to go around a tree in front of him, uh, probably have to turn over a forehand shot here, and then hyzer back around a cypress guardian tree that's at about 100 feet. And Drew right over the top of the basket as well as that's carried to the right-hand side. I'm trying to get clarification as if he is. Is there OB on that right-hand side? Th there is OB on the right-hand side, but he skipped and hit a tree. I think he's actually just a touch short. I'm, I, can't, I can't tell exactly which tree he hit. He should be right around the circle's edge, probably 40 or 50 feet from the uh, from the OB line. So he's he's doing fine over there. He's just going to have to uh, he's going to have to hit a putt to save that three. Yeah, Nate Sexton with a furthest drive in the group again. Very unique approach here with his backhand cut roller. 
Nate and I talking just last weekend. He says that myself and a few others have really given him a reputation of being a conservative player when, in fact, he feels like he's a very smart but mildly aggressive player. So this is definitely a aggressive play here. And his flick goes around that cypress tree that Drew was dealing with, and it looked like he hit the pole uh, right underneath the uh, right underneath the base. So uh, when he goes to his bread and butter forehand, he hits the pole. When he goes to his uh, slightly less bread and butter backhand cut roller around the tree, uh, the results weren't as uh, weren't as phenomenal. So that would be like bread and maybe chunky peanut butter instead, instead of bread and butter. I mean, there's nothing wrong with peanut butter or being chunky. I'm not really sure what you're saying. No inference whatsoever. <laughs> I'm a creamy guy myself. Or if you can take that same peanut butter and put it in a candy coating like a peanut butter M&M, that's, that's a pretty fantastic way to spend snack time, if you ask me. I love me some snacks, and what I also love are some scores. Let's check them out. So Will and Kell are having a discussion. Um, they have had a chance to practice this hole earlier, but this is a new hole. This is one of those new holes from about six weeks ago. Um, a new tee box and a new basket um, to really stretch things out. This is the first par four uh, that they're facing today. Uh, they should have already hit one if we were playing the traditional course, hole number five. So this is the first chance that they have to really try to uh, um, uh, tackle two shots together. three competitors here on the tee talking about different things. now there is if they want to be uh, really aggressive there is a flick shot um, or a, yeah probably only a flick shot is the only way you can go if you want to go left however um, if you take that shot you are challenging a bush that is every bit of 80 feet um, long and probably a hundred feet wide and if you get in the middle of that it is darkness and thorns um, there is a straight shot, however, that straight shot, you're going to have to just absolutely smoke one. Um, you could never get it more than about 12 or 15 feet high, and the danger on that shot is that if you hit one of those trees, you're going to be 400 out from the basket with an awful angle. So it can get you down there. If you really groove that shot, you could probably get down to within 100, uh, but I'm not sure that the risk uh, is better than the reward on that because you're still probably going to get a three even if you throw a perfect shot down the middle. Kale's looking for the play. <laughs> Don't hit the tree 100 feet off the box. That's okay. tip number one. What about the Nate Sexton cut roller? Now that's an option. Yeah, have you ever seen me throw a roller, Terry? I hadn't seen you throwing too many pancakes until a few holes ago either. Yeah, that was that was the first in about five years, so maybe I'm due for a roller too. We'll see. All right, looks like we're live and ready to go here in just a few moments. Paul was going over that bush with a power any destroyer shot, I think. Uh, it looks like he is caught right on the edge. I can't tell if he was in it or not. Uh, that, that could be fine. It could be um, some work to get up and down from there. And Will following suit going with his orange D2. He punches through some trees, and I think he took the exact line right towards the basket. Um, but again, even with that great line, I think he's probably uh, 60 feet out at the best.
Mikhail now going with his white Uli stamped D3. And he hits one of those protector trees, but he falls down in the middle. So he, he's going to have a, an angle at the basket, but he's going to have some distance he's going to need to convey here for that three. And Simon takes the same line as Will, but does not hit the tree, and that is flying perfectly. That might actually be the uh, the perfect shot for the two putt. Um, you, the, this is a hidden basket from the box, so that shows the difference between the top card and the second card here. Just totally different um, strategies here on the on the second card. We saw three high hyzers and one cut roller, all of those out to the right. On the lead card here, we saw three tight, low power annies and one power, low straight shot. Um, so I don't know if uh, if it really is a follow the leader sort of mentality that the first guy did it and everybody saw the line and agreed with it, or if they just really disagree that much about what the best way to attack this hole is. Kale now from probably 350 feet. He's going to have to have a little bit of hyzer on his disc at the front, and then it's going to need to stand up flat for the middle part of the flight with a slight hyzer finish. And he got the hyzer and the stand up flat. It needs to slide on the ground a little bit. He had the right angle. Great shot there. He's giving himself a look for the three. I'm guessing he's probably about 40 or 50 short, but a really good shot from where he was to be able to try to uh, make a run at this birdie putt. Dixon, we spoke earlier of the changes that needed to be made out here regarding the weather that has just come past. What are we looking at for weather for the next few days? Oh, we're actually looking pretty good. Um, there might be a little bit of wind and rain tomorrow, but it's, it's not going to be the storms that we were facing on Tuesday. Paul got to the back side of the bush, which left him there for a Nova shot. He's put it a little bit right of where he was aiming. Uh, I think his distance was just right on, um, but he is uh, probably 20 to 25 feet to the right. So long as he got past that, uh, got past that tree, he should be doing fine. That's a pretty thick tree. If you're on the wrong side of that, you'd have to do quite the stretch out to be able to see what uh, what's going on there. It looks like Will and Simon, um, for, as, for as much as Simon looked like he peered his shot compared to Will, uh, he's only about four feet further. So that makes me wonder if uh, one was maybe, well, Will threw his D2. Maybe Simon had a, more of a mid-range shot there. Will is at about 80 feet. He's got a low-hanging branch high and to the left. It's going to he's going to need to do a high hyzer putt or a low straight one uh, that can't get more than about 12 feet high. And his white PA3 is a little bit low and long, but the good part about having a, a long drive on this hole is that was an eagle putt, so he's gonna have a simple cleanup for his birdie three. Simon gives it a great run. Everybody in the crowd started to hold their breath. Simon gave it a little bit of a knee bend. He had the angle right, but he came up just a touch short. Kale's shot was much better than I thought as far as distance goes. He is at probably 25 or 30 feet here for his birdie three.
And as expected, no problems for Kale here. He's going to take a birdie three. Shows a little bit of his scrambling capabilities. Not exactly an ideal tee shot, but he's able to get up and down and capitalize on that birdie attempt. Uh, and it shows his ability to get past that bad shot. He was frustrated after the drive, but executed excellently right after that. And as also expected, anything inside the circle by Paul McBeth, you normally would count on him with his McPro AVR. Will Shoestrick is going to wait for the gallery and the rest of the players to get in position. Same with Simon. And again, Shoestrick's putt with a just a little bit different approach here I've seen. And that looks like that one's gotten him on this short putt from 15. Yeah, he was, he was high and right. He was really hoping for those chains to be sticky. That was about the only way that one was going to stay in. It slowed it down pretty good, but as it dropped, it caught those nubs on the right-hand side and fell out. Uh, that is a definite miss, and I'm curious to see how, uh, how steamy Will, Will's going to be as he's waiting to throw on this box where... With that excellent drive, I'm sure walking off the box, he thought he was going to have a pretty good look at an eagle, and he walks away at a, with a par. Hole 9 now, traditional 9 on the course, we're actually playing hole 8. Um, all of the holes between here and 17, we're going to be one off as far as number goes because of the changes we've made to the course. And here on one of the shortest holes we'll find on the course, Macbeth going with a champion Ooh. monster forehand. Puts himself pretty much right on the wood chips. Yeah, that was a, uh, it took a real slow kind of slow motion skip there. And I think for a second, everybody thought that might just fall right in the basket. Excellent shot. Kale going with the other way to approach this hole with a straight putter shot. And he is about the same distance as Paul on the right-hand side. They're both inside of 10 for sure. Fantastic touch there by Kale. And Lazat with his C-line putter. Playing a little pinball up there. Yeah, well, it looked like he was going to hit about three different limbs on the way, and that elevator just kept going down. Missed every limb, caught a tree just deep of the basket, actually kicked him right back towards it. So right now, if Will wants to be CTP, he needs to get about five feet from the basket. And what did you call that earlier? An anti-skip? I think that's exactly yeah. what he got there. He's yeah. going to leave him pretty close to the basket looking at a birdie opportunity. Yeah, that was a great shot there by Willie. Actually kind of challenged the tree right under the, uh, I guess we'd say kind of the armpit of that tree, um, which is the, the spot you got to be real careful with. We're on the backside of Monkey Island now. If you hit that tree, you pretty much shoot straight down into the OB Island. That's really the only danger. Um, that you can find on this hole with that shot. And so uh, Will really playing on the edges right there. He gets a nice skip on the green. I bet our furthest guy out right now is maybe 10 feet. This was an excellent group of drives. Um, but it's what is to be expected on the shortest hole here on the course. This really is one that uh, if you get a three, you definitely feel like you've lost strokes to just about the entire field. And we'll have some easy cleanup here on hole nine. So that was Simon from 12 feet. Here goes Kale from 10 feet. And Will will step up from about seven, uh, but Paul, just because these are all so close, steps in and hits his five footer. And there you go. The first all-star of the round from our all-star card.
we'll move over to the gorgeous looking peninsula hole i believe no we got we got one hole to wait before that this is traditional hole 10 hole 9 as we're playing it right now uh this one can actually get some people in trouble if you're not being careful i'm i'm curious to see how um kale handles this this is a hole that uh, pretty much everybody is going to throw a flick on uh the hole almost demands it now I don't listen to holes tell me what to do, so I throw a backhand turnover shot on this one. And I usually end up in the water on the left, but that doesn't stop me from trying. I was thinking the exact same thing yesterday, that we will likely see a backhand here from Kale. Kale, not a forehand thrower whatsoever. Uh, but as you mentioned, I think we're going to see the other three competitors go with a forehand shot as it sets up nicely for that. You're going to want to be playing away from the OB, the OB being on the left-hand side. Yeah, there is a uh, OB road on the right. There is a sidewalk, but uh, that sidewalk is actually in play. Um, there's a road about 40 feet or so to the right of the basket. Um, the creek here runs down the entire left-hand side, and the closer you get to the basket, the closer the creek is. Right down there at the pinch point of the basket, the creek is at uh, 20 feet or so on a downslope from the basket. There's a mando on this hole that uh, uh, people used to just throw hyzers right out over the, uh, the sidewalk and the road, um, skip right back in and take an easy birdie putt here. Um, but the mando will keep you left on this hole. Uh, and not only does this water give you an OB stroke, uh, when you look at this water, you feel like it's going to give you hepatitis as well. It is a stagnant land, and it is not where you want to be. Yeah, one of the most interesting facts that I learned here in Emporia, Kansas, that the fountain in this water, just beyond us, is the third highest fountain in Emporia. Did you hear that too? I did not know that. I feel like I could do a cannonball and become the second highest fountain in Emporia. I mean, that thing's only shooting about seven feet right now. And our players here on our featured card are waiting for the second card to move off the tee on the next hole here. Be free of distraction. We're here in town, uh, and so there is a group of school kids um, just leaving school right now. Marty Gregoire down at the basket, making sure we don't kill any little fellas here. Uh, here in just a second, I believe he'll give the go ahead. We see Macbeth's forehand shot carried to the right-hand side. Beautiful straight to turnover shot there by Leviska. Surprisingly, Simon going with the turnover shot as well. He ends up on the right-hand side, right about the sidewalk. It didn't quite hyzer back as much as he was hoping. Pretty surprised he didn't go with a flick there. Paul went with a flick and let it go a little bit early, but he stayed in bounds after a soft skip. And Schuster gets off of the tree, and it kicks him toward the left-hand side. Yeah, he was coming in a little bit early there. That that tree on the flick shot is actually a, a good tree. Usually if you hit that one, that means you let go early, and you're heading towards the road. So you're usually happy to hit that tree. However, Will got a roll, made him think a little bit about that. He was about to head right back to the water. Uh, but he stopped. He's going to be our 
furthest from the pin here, probably 80 feet out, 100 feet out, with a little skinny guardian tree, a little more than halfway, that he's going to have to try to get around. You got to be a little bit careful running putts on this basket because it is downsloped uh, and walking from the basket straight to the water is the general path that people take to walk across a little pipe uh, and so that is very much worn down actually Will's roll actually went forward a little bit he's just outside the circle maybe 40 feet he's actually got a decent look at a deuce putt right here and Will sees a few spectators that are wandering around behind the basket and he's asking for them just to hold up here and they're gonna step aside here we'll reset and line up for the birdie yeah those guys were kind of stuck between a mosey and a saunter they finally got out of the way there Yeah, you're right. I'm starting to notice he does have a little bit of hitch in his giddy up there right uh, right when he starts to pull forward on his swing. Paul now from about the same distance, but this is an absolute death putt. If he doesn't draw metal, he's going to go into the water. And plenty of metal there with a birdie from Paul McBath. Now, it does look a little bit awkward seeing someone on the right-hand side here, what would normally be an OB in many course situations with this sidewalk. However, this week as they're playing this layout, OB is only the road and beyond. So they are both inbounds, both McBath and Lazat. Oh, goodness. Simon is very happy for that half-inch wide pipe at the top of the basket. He would have sailed straight to the OB water, but instead he's got about two feet to go. Kale now with the uh, turnover putter shot that was just the perfect distance. He's about 10 or 12 feet short. Kale in for the deuce. I was just going to mention that Kale taking his time. Not going to take anything for granted here. Yeah, this is really the course of the tournament where you're going to score the best uh, as far as your chance to get twos. Between Jones East and Country Club, the courses for Friday and Saturday, there's not really a whole lot of opportunity to get those twos. Uh, and so this is the course where you feel like you, your pars are just losing ground. Um, so you really want to be careful out here to put up a good score, but you just can't get you can't get too loose with it as Simon almost did right there. The good thing is, putt was on line, or else he'd have missed that flag, and uh, and added a circle to the scorecard here. This is a very unique layout as we're moving over to course hole number eleven. We see that the players from the card ahead of us are no more than. 150 feet up into the right-hand side. Yeah, they're actually teeing off on hole 12, um, which will give, uh, usually when somebody's teeing off on 12 right there, um, people give them an opportunity to throw and walk off. This is the hole where we're really going to see how aggressive these guys are wanting to be during the first round. Um, it is a, the hole is out on a peninsula. It's 321 feet. If you wanted to go for this basket, you need to carry about 305 feet. Um, and then you have to land on an upslope and then sit down because this uh, entire peninsula is only about 30 feet wide as the players are looking at it. The general play if you're not going for this shot is to throw um, either a, a slow putter shot just to lay up about 100 short to leave a jump putt or to throw a flick skipping over to pin high leaving yourself about 80. Um, there's a couple different ways to do it. Paul actually looks like he's lining up maybe a thumber shot. Or maybe he was just goofing off with the disc. Yeah, he's going with a flick here. This is Macbeth with his champion monster.
Beth with a very conservative shot here, throwing his forehand monster, as we said. Yeah, that's really the only play, unless you've already determined that I'm going for this hole. Um, it's such a hard green to stick to from the box. Kale gets through to the open spot. Yeah, and the penalty is if you if you go in the water on your drive here, you don't play it where it last went out of bounds. There is a drop zone at the end of the peninsula. Lazat also with a putter here off the tee. That's his sea line putter. And I'm not sure how he missed the left side of that tree right there. He, his... Yeah, I'm not sure you could have fit a shadow between his disc and that tree. If he had hit it, he would have launched right to the water. Will with his H1 fairway driver. And they are all in about the same spot. They all have a good angle at the basket, um, but they're all sitting probably 60 to 80 feet away. We're going to see how aggressive these guys want to be on that long putt with a down-sloping green on both sides of the basket, both sides going to water. Yeah, this is a hole where you really find out if somebody's frustrated with their first 10 holes out at the course on whether or not they go for it. Um, that really the shot that I've seen be the most successful, and I'm, I'm, I would be shocked if anybody did it during the glass blown, is to throw that flick that Paul and Will threw, but throw it flat and hard and actually skip the water. Um, if you do that, it allows you to get inside of where these guys are, and it's actually a relatively safe shot. I guess as safe as it can be since you're jumping off of water, but it puts you inside, well, right about the circle's edge to have a putt if you can execute that. Looks like Will's going to be up first. He's got a couple of trees that are actually in his way. He's going to have to throw either a little touch flick or maybe a high jump putt. The last tree that he's trying to beat is probably right at the circle's edge, so if he can get around that fourth tree, then, uh, then he should have a, a pretty decent look. He's got a little bit of slop right at his feet, but I think he's able to get a good jump putt stance here. A solid effort there by Schustrick, as you said, some mud that he was contending with on the only muddy spot really on this landing zone. However, it didn't seem to give him any troubles. This is Laviska. Yeah, Will actually went in between trees number two and three. Kale looks like he's looking at the same gap. Turnover putt just to lay up. Paul and Simon are a touch closer, but that tree might be in their way. Yeah, Paul's just doing his, uh, his layup here from about 80 feet. And as we've seen with a few other holes, wow, that is a very aggressive attempt there by, by Macbeth. I was thinking he'd be a little bit lighter touch with that. Well, yeah, it, with, for as quick as he walked up and practiced his stroke, I thought he was just going to lay up. But he, uh, he went for it, and I'm sure that gave Simon some uh, courage to do the same. And that could have been very disastrous there for Simon Lazat. It was a great attempt, however, just a bit short. As we watch our players move on to the peninsula, they'll be cleaning up. Everyone should have easy tap-ins. They're going to move off of this peninsula hole with a three. What a gorgeous backdrop that we see there in the background. As we said, the third largest fountain in Emporia. That's, uh, that's got to be in a book somewhere, right? Or some sort of uh, plaque somewhere talking about the immensity of this fountain? Where, where exactly did you pick up this knowledge? I, um, I think I read that exactly. That was on a plaque at the beginning of the course. And they move off. Well, that is the course hole number 11. We're going to be able to give you the preview for course hole number 12 as they were put together earlier in the week. 
Yeah, there's uh, we, there's basically only a sheet of paper that calls this whole number 11, and that's the sheet of paper that we wrote at about 7 o'clock this morning after we figured out what we were doing. So, yeah, uh, the, the number on the whole preview is going to be inaccurate, but the whole preview itself will tell you all you need to know about hole number 12 at Peter Pan. Hole 12 plays long and straight, slightly downhill to the basket, 450 feet away. Plenty of trees and OB to the right and left continue the Peter Pan tradition on this hole. The safe route curves slightly around to the right near the end of the fairway, while the more direct route takes about 150 feet over water to the basket. Players heading the direct route will need to watch out for two trees that guard the basket just off the water and have a high risk of punishing an off-course approach with penalty strokes. Now this hole changed quite a bit. We have a new pin, uh, and actually if you throw to the short pin from where we're going to now, you would be in an awful position. You want to try to throw about 275 with a slight hyzer, and then approach the basket across the lake. Paul going with the layup shot, but left it a little short. Kale looks like he is landing in the choice spot uh, as far as the distance goes. I couldn't tell if he was right past, uh, right past or right in front of kind of the one guardian tree on that shot. If you lay up to the edge of the water there, you're left with about 200 straight at it or a flick shot. Simon Lozat looks to be at least teased here. A very aggressive approach off to the left-hand side. We're going to see he's got both a driver and a putter in his hands. And he's unsure as to, looks like he's going to go for, yeah, that is in fact his trusty, one of his trusty PD2s. <laughs> Confirming that there's yeah. no mandatories. Simon might be trying something here. We've always wondered what these guys would do. And he goes with the high enormous shot. It is hyzering right. If he has the distance, that's going to be putting. And he has, I'm going to guess he's found the water uh, based on the way that the uh, crowd gave kind of a, a moan. Um, y yeah, that <laughs> that shot is uh, it's pretty incredible. I mean, he's He's trying to get over a tree that is 80 feet tall, maybe 70 feet tall, and that tree is every bit of 320 feet away. Uh, and he's in order to, if he beats that tree, he'll find green grass. But if he stalls at all, he's in the water. Will throwing the PA2 and ending up in the perfect spot to get across this and get his birdie three. So that uh, that stroke that Simon saved a couple of holes ago by playing smart looks like he just gave it right back. <laughs> that uh, we've we've debated here in town about how could you get to this hole if you felt like you had to deuce this. Um, and the two lines that we discussed, uh, neither one of those really came in our mind that you would throw that shot. Simon just did. He uh, He's an incredible thrower of the disc. And I've been playing disc golf for a long time, and it never occurred to me to try to throw over that stuff. He just he has an eye and an arm that I just don't understand sometimes. Paul now from probably 250, there is a guardian tree that if you hit, you almost certainly fall in the water. Looks like yeah. a low release originally. However, the wind picked it up, carried him directly to the pin. Yeah, he was actually going right at that tree. He even gave his disc a little pep talk while it was in the air. And it, uh, it listened, turned short, slid right up to the basket. Paul with a tap-in birdie putt coming. And as you mentioned, both Schusterick and Leviska with choice landing spots here. Just uh, 12 feet away from one another. 
Yeah, they're right around 200, maybe a little less. Dead straight shot. Lots of options. Get in. Get in. And Kale giving it a run there, just right of the pin. Schuster would be happy with that effort as well. Also, right on line, Schuster comes up just a few feet short. Yeah, it really shows how important the drive is on this hole. That uh, you can't just uh, you can't just bomb and hope for the best. It, it really does behoove you to try to get your three to throw that first shot about 250 feet and put yourself in a good spot. Simon now right at the corner of the lake where he's gone out of bounds. He's probably only a hundred feet short of the basket. However, there is a bush that is he is about two feet behind that he's going to have to deal with. Um, we are right next to 13's tee, so we're going to go ahead and let the second card tee off. And we just walked up on Germ again. Let's see. And <laughs> the three shots that we've watched, two of them have hit a basket, and that one almost did. I think if Jerm knew this, he would uh, come over here and pull us off of the first card and tell him to come watch. Nate Sexton will be next to T. And Nate looks to have been very efficient with that drive. And in just a moment here, we're going to be ready for... Lazat to throw his second shot. Of course, taking a penalty after going in the water. He's going to get a clarification here by card mate Will Schustrick. So Simon is uh, the bush in front of him, right in front of him. It is uh, it's right at the height of his hat. However, a few feet in front of that, it goes up to probably ten feet tall. He's trying to figure out. Um, exactly which direction the uh, to take his drop from he's gonna need some relief from this uh, as much relief from this bush as he can get um, and of course per PDGA rules anytime you find yourself OB whether it be road water sidewalk or anything else you're always welcome to bring yourself up to three feet just over just exactly one meter I should say yeah three feet three inches I believe is the is the meter mark So about 50 feet in front of Simon, he had to hit a gap about 12 feet high, and he did and gave that basket a run. But he's going to have about five feet for his par while everybody else cleans up their tidy second shots for the easy birdie threes on this hole. Yeah, besides the fact that I can't throw the shot Simon did, I'm not sure that I would. Um, because not only does he have to uh, execute that and, and make the grass, he's got to throw such an aggressive shot that you then have to throw that shot even more perfect so that you're putting. I mean, if you can throw that shot and you're still 60 out and you're probably not going to make that putt, you know, what's really the point when you can play as conservative and easy as Will and Kale did and, uh, and get the same score? It just seems to bring in trouble that, that you don't really need at this point in the tournament. Well, certainly an interesting fact that Simon said he did not practice this course prior to the tournament. said he hasn't played here in two years uh, since he was last competing at this event. So he's coming out here and playing it fresh and, uh, we'll say, mildly blind. All right, that is, what hole is that on? That was hole number 12, uh, right. as the course reads, but hole number 11 for our competitors today. All right, well, we are moving over. There's going to be a slight back up here on the next hole. We're going to stand down for just a few moments and take a break. Let's listen to a word from our sponsors over at Dynamic Disc and the rest of the amazing supporters here for the 2016 Glass Blown Open. So you've just walked into a disc golf store. 
Look at all that sweet plastic. So many new discs to try. But you have your trusty compadres. Why would you want to try something new? What if you don't like this new disc? Rest easy when shopping at any of our buyback retailers. If you are not completely satisfied with a disc from Dynamic Discs, Latitude 64, or Westside Discs, bring it back within 14 days with proof of purchase and we will replace it with whatever disc you want. It is that simple. Now get out there and play some disc golf. Check out dynamicdiscs.com slash retail to find a buyback retail partner near you. Lunch. Hey, can you go tell Jeremy it's here? Sure. Hey, Jeremy, pizza's here. Yeah, give me two minutes. Two minutes! Two minutes! Hey, can you hold on just a sec? Thanks. Two minutes! Okay, I'm back. Two minutes! For me, it's time with my friends. For me, it's a walk in the park. For me, it's my job. Go in. Oh. For me, it's all about the exercise. For me, it fits into my busy lifestyle. For me, it's my passion. For us, it doesn't cost much to play. For me, it's fun. And we are back here, hole number 13 on the course. Uh, this is a hole that uh, that all of these players feel like they should get. It's right at 400 feet, um, and it's just a it's really just a wide open hyzer. Um, the delay we're on right now is that uh, hole 14's tee pad is about halfway down this fairway and to the right. Uh, but Big Jerem actually looked back and just waved them on, so they must be waiting on something as well. This is going to be all of these players go through. Um, go to stable distance driver shot. We feel a light breeze coming over our shoulder, somewhat left to right. And Paul actually puts that a little more flat than he needs to and goes deep. Probably got about 60 feet or so coming back to the basket. Kale now, I believe that was his D3. He needs to get some ground action. Oh, not that kind of ground action. The Parks Department here in Emporia has actually gone through all of those trees right there and cleaned up the bottom couple of feet. So while that's good as far as if you have to get in there, the problem is that it's a lot easier to get in there. So he's going to have a very difficult putt out.
Will actually go in with an M2 here, a, f a mid range shot. And he has the distance to get it there, and it lands so soft. Simon throwing his metal flake FD3 there. And he gets some good ground action. You could tell that wasn't the same sort of mid-range that Will threw because of that uh, skip there. Uh, good adjustment by Simon there to see Paul's mistake of leaving it too flat, going to touch more stable, uh, and knowing that if he threw something with a sharp edge on it, he could get some action to get him closer to the basket there. And as we move down the fairway here, Dixon, we'd like to, of course, invite everyone to join us for tonight's GBO Day Number One wrap-up show. We'll be hosting a podcast taking place at the Dynamic Disc Distribution Center, which is, of course, a mouthful to say. And we welcome everyone to join us at 8:30 p.m. Central. Talk about some of the activities going on out at the distribution center tonight, Dixon. Well, yeah, tonight is actually the uh, Swedish bonfire. Um, this was a tradition we started last year. Um, April 30th is a national holiday in Sweden. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the story is behind it, but uh, you build a giant bonfire that everybody stands around and sings songs, and then you uh, have a bunch of several small fires that you, uh, you know, cook uh, marshmallows and hot dogs and things like that around. So um, last year they were in town on April the 30th, and they were missing their holiday and they asked if we could have a bonfire i guess if if you or i were in sweden on july the 4th we might ask for a hamburger or something um so that that's how it got started we had a good time last year so uh this year instead of me trying to start the fire with three bottles of lighter fluid and it totally not working we've got an actual um professional pyromaniac a local firefighter that will uh that will start the fire for us so hopefully that'll uh, go a lot better it's just a good time to hang out um that's one of the cool things about glass blown is just kind of everybody does things together. Um, one of our um, most favorite sponsors here in town, Radius Brewing Company, uh, will be out there with some of their craft brews. Um, so we uh, we're going to sit by the fire and drink some beer and hang out and talk about day one. You lost me at s'mores. I can't actually promise there's going to be s'mores there. The views of this commentator may or may not be accurate. And as we wait for our card to tee or, or throw their approach shots, I'm sorry, we're seeing Big Germ throw his tee shot here on course hole number 14. Yeah, that's a downhill. It really lines up great for his flick shot, um, but he puts it a little too tight. I don't think he went OB on the right-hand side, but he is in a very thick cedar bush. And he turned around, and uh, he was not happy with that shot. Drew now going with the... Backhand shot, I believe this is an Emac Truth he's throwing. And that clipped a tree branch, but it uh, looks like it's just going to hyzer out at the end. Yeah, that had a good turn on it. That disc would have held that ante for a little bit, uh, but I think that tree branch took some steam off of it. He's pin high, but he's going to be about 70 or 80 left. Rick now, surprisingly, with a backhand. This hole seems to set up really well for his forehand. So, as you said, a little bit surprising he went with the backhand. It Although, be somewhat effective. Though. Yeah, I believe that was his uh, compass there, which he is. A, it was a disc design for him, and he's been throwing it all over the world, doing exactly what he wants to do with it. Um, but he is frustrated. I can see as he sits down in his chair. Curious what's happening with his score right now. Sexton throwing a likely a star Excalibur there and the gallery that is formed amongst these two cards thoroughly enjoyed it and Ricky grabs his cart and he is off at a sprint uh, 
must not uh, must not be going so good for Rick right now. Although well, with somebody of his caliber, it may be that he birdied ten in a row and this is his first par or something, and he's super frustrated. I don't know. Yeah, that is, Ricky does have some high expectations, and one of his classic lines anytime he throws a less than ideal shot is usually he utters out the word junk. Looks like Kale has found himself short and on the left-hand side. Yeah, he has uh, jumped in about 20 feet under those low-hanging branches. He has got a tree that's probably three times as wide as he is right in front of him. He's only probably about 60 feet from the basket, but I doubt he's got anything other than a pitch out. Kale second guessing his stance here. Looks like he's going to reposition himself thanks to our friends over at the PDJ and the rest of the Glass Blown Open staff. We're able to follow along with live scoring on PDGALive.com. And we see, in fact, you called it, Dixon. Uh, looks like Ricky Wahisaki is 8 under through 12 holes. So that may have been his first misfire <laughs> today. And he, he may have uttered junk. I wish I was so good that my. <laughs> I could get upset at things like not being nine down after 13 holes. And right out of Paul's hand, you could tell he had released it with a little too much power or speed as it carried up and over the basket. He felt a little right to left win, so surprising that it carried up and over as it did. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised. I mean, Paul, is he's playing better than, you know, 99% of the people in the world that would play this course, but not very good for Paul right now. And in the last four years, Paul has finished no worse than second. Paul very frustrated here as he's moved over to his lie after that putt, and he noticed that he was very obstructed. And he's going to go with a awkward, not only is it a straddle putt, but his knee, his main supporting knee is behind his supporting foot. However, doesn't matter. Yeah. It's Paul McBeth. What do you know? He, what he do just, I know? He just throws it in from 25 from a knee with a bush coming over his ear. But here goes uh, Simon for his birdie putt from about 20. And up and in. And Will now with an excellent shot. He's got less than 10 feet. Um, and actually, Kale is still out. you got to love it when you drive and there are multiple shots to happen before your putt. Anytime you're last to putt, it's a good thing. Old T-shirt from back when we were in our younger playing days that I love to see was dry first, putt last. Yeah, did you used to rock this shirt? I believe that was the disc pimp, and I would not classify oh. myself as such. Earlier in the week, you caught up with our now leading woman, Katrina Allen. We're going to catch up with her and see what she had to say just yesterday. So as a past champion of glass blown, does that give you confidence? Does it give you pressure? Uh, what do you think about uh, as, you're, as you're approaching this event? Uh, I guess confidence, um, but also a little pressure. I mean, my mom loves the glass trophy, so she puts a lot of pressure on me <laughs> to bring home. Uh, she has two, I think, and so she's always like, I don't have enough. So that's the most pressure. <laughs> All right, have a good day. Remember, if you don't like those discs, bring them back. We are excited to present to you a new program that will help set you apart from the competition. We want to invite you to become a buyback retailer. We have learned that this program helps the customer feel greater levels of satisfaction, as well as gives the customer confidence in buying Dynamic Discs, Latitude 64, and Westside Disc products. So what is the buyback program? If you have a customer that is not familiar with our brands, let them know they can purchase one of our discs, and if they are not completely satisfied, they can bring it back with proof of purchase within 14 days, and we will replace it with whatever disc they want in the store of any brand. It really is that simple. This buyback program has been testing out in many stores, and we have received very exciting reports back. Number one, it has been overwhelmingly positively received. Number two, the stores have reported much higher customer satisfaction. And number three, the stores have all reported increased sales. We believe that the buyback program is a truly unique program 
and it will give your customer confidence in buying the product, and it will give you, the store owner, the opportunity to move much more product. We do have a few requirements to become a buyback retailer, so be sure to check out dynamicdiscom slash buyback for more detailed information and how to apply. Once you become a buyback program retailer, your store will be listed on our site as a buyback retailer, and we will provide you with all the promotional material that you need to make this program a success in your store. So be sure to go to dynamicdiscom slash buyback. Hey everybody, Jeremy Rusco with Dynamic Discs. It's glass blown open week. It's finally here. We're super excited and we want to welcome you to town. The glass blown open experience is more than just your average disc golf event. It incorporates so many things with more players than any other event in the history of disc golf. We start out on Tuesday with the Flex Start C tier at Jones West and follow that up with a free bowling night at Flint Hills Lane. Wednesday, we have the player check in where all the players get the uh, the highly anticipated player pack. We've got a Flex Start seat tier out at Peter Pan Park. And then uh, Wednesday evening at the Granada Theater, we got to meet the owners of Dynamic Discs, Latitude 64 and Westside Discs. Following that up, we have the pro panel where some of the top pros in the world will answer your questions about disc golf. And then we have the player meeting. At this player meeting, we'll also have a special introduction of the international players where we currently have 46 players uh, coming from other countries other than the United States. So then Thursday is the official first start of the competition. Um, and then Thursday night, Swedish tradition, Swedish bonfire at the Dynamic Distribution Warehouse. Friday, second round of competition. Um, and then a lot of stuff going on Friday night with the uh, putting competition semifinals at the Granada Theater. And then we also have the poker party at the Emporia Country Club. Saturday, spectator day come out to the Emporia Country Club, watch the best disc golfers in the world, compete for their chance to take home a glass blown open trophy and take home the title. As soon as the round gets over, we're gonna head down to the best disc golf block party on the planet, downtown Emporia, Commercial Street in front of the Dynamic Discs retail store and in front of the Granada Theater. Gonna have a lot of stuff going on there with the award ceremony, the ring of fire, the punting competition finals. It's gonna be a great week in Emporia. I want to thank you for what you're doing to help grow the sport and I want to thank you for being a part of the glass blown open in case you are not able to make it to emporia for the glass blown open we still want you to be able to follow all the action stay up to date with the glassblownopen.com and dynamicdisc.com websites you can also follow the dynamic discs and glass blown open facebook pages instagram twitter snapchat and the glass blown open mobile app Will ripping a PA2 down the hill. Uh, they actually have a it, it, throwing a putter on this hole is not what uh, most people would normally do. But number one, this is well, shoe streak number two. We have a little bit of a tailwind whipping up, probably 10 to 15 miles an hour right now, and it is a downhill hole shot. And Lazat waits for a slight distraction before throwing his P2. Wow, his PD2 forehand. I know I keep repeating that he's throwing a PD2. All of the yellow ones are all, in fact, PD2s. I just thought you were making that up because you didn't know. Let me guess, you're just going to say that was Paul throwing a destroyer, huh? It is, in fact, a destroyer. His swirly ones are the lesser stable ones. I believe he carries seven or eight of them in his bag, so it's, it's a pretty good guess.
Kill now taking the same sort of strategy as Will with the, the M4. And this is panning out, running right at the basket. Oh, man. And from what a shot. From our T area, tough to tell just how far off that was, but I, Kale had it dialed yeah. in here. I, I think that probably slid and hit the pole. Simons, I think. 93 feet. Yeah, Simons might be uh, a touch short and to the right, I think. He flashed in front of the basket. It, it gave him an ooh and ah because it went across chain high, but I think he was a little bit short. Kale, I think, is right on the pole. Because even if his distance wasn't right in the air, he's sliding down a hill towards the basket if he was short. This is a hole that gets a lot of people, uh, similar to how it got Ricky and Will, or Ricky and uh, Germ on the card before. You try to put something out there to the left and turn it over, and you just end up floating downhill towards this uh, OB line and giant cedar tree. Uh, so those uh, that shot by Kale was just a phenomenal use of the available space to turn something over and then let it get stable right back towards the basket. I guess it would be safe to say Kale looking for that hashtag GBO moment, ringing up an ace here during the opening round would uh, would certainly qualify. Yeah, it looks like he's sitting about two feet behind the basket, if I can, uh, if I'm making out that teal disc right. Can we call it a GBO mint? Can we can we run them together there? Yeah. Bang from Will. That was every bit of 80 or 90 feet around a tree. Center chains with his PA2. Fantastic shot by Will. does not give it the snap that it needs to stand up flat. He hyzers out early. As you mentioned, Simon Lazat looks to be on this right-hand side of this tree line, just a bit short. And he has skipped into the... Yeah. Oh, he has found that he is pin high right on the edge he might have to yeah he might have to finagle with this tree a little bit looks like he's doing the same sort of stance paul had on the last hole but with opposite leg he got a tree tickling his neck while he's trying to think about this and no problems there for lazat great birdie here on the 393 foot hole number 14 course hole 14. Yeah, three out of four birdies on this uh, on this hole. Even for this group, that's a, that's a really on this hole. You, you don't see that many deuces usually happen. Kale in for the perfect drive, tap in putt. That's the that's the ideal way to play any sort of hole. So Terry, since I'm uh, smashing words together here. I guess I'm on the smash box, right? So can we, can we ask the uh, the smashies at home to come up with our celebrity couple name? Or is that, that, is that a dangerous question to ask? That is a very, very scary uh, thought out there. But uh, we certainly welcome, we welcome not only that, but I'd also, every broadcast, we challenge you guys to please go out and show us how you're watching Smashbox TV. Are you at work? Are you on the beach? Where are you? Take a picture. Let us know how you and your friends are enjoying the show, whether it's on a computer or a TV screen or maybe in a theater. Or maybe you're at a local bar or establishment right here in Emporia. We'd love to see how you're watching it. Take a picture. So we are at course hole number 15, 515 feet. Um, this hole is a, it's a bomber's paradise. However, right down by the basket, the OB pinches in. The river that's been flooding the course is actually the right-hand border on the backside of these trees. When we get down to the basket, you're going to see how fast this water is moving, that it is pushing entire trees down. I have no doubt that Simon is aiming for these chains right now. Uh, 
Uh, needs to hold that. Just like that, he's given it a run. And he has landed in the safe spot, probably right at the circle's edge on a 515-foot hole. Fantastic drive by Simon Lazat. Kale now clubbing down, going with Will's theory. He's got an M4 here. He's just going to put it in play and leave himself about 200 to go. And as we're watching Kale's shot finish on the left-hand side, Paul McBeth will be up next. Drew Gibson on the previous card, in fact, birdied this 515-foot hole. Yeah, if that was his orange disc I saw, it looked like he only has got about a 10-foot putt to finish up there. Paul going for this as well. I believe that was his Thunderbird. Turnover flex shot and could use a little bit more height. However, he's going to be content with that as we move down the fairway. Again, thanks to our help over at pdgalive.com, we see that Ricky Waisaki is sitting 8 under through 14 holes. Nicola Castro also sitting at 8 under par. Kale Leviska at 7 down. Schusterick, Simon Lazat, and Drew Gibson, along with Eric McCabe, all at 6 under par. Paul McBeth and Jeremy Colling at 5 down. So... Not too many surprises up there on the top of this leader card or this leader board. Looking forward to an exciting weekend. Each competitor is, of course, only playing each of these courses one time. So there's not an opportunity or chance to make any redemption while they're out here. One course, one day, three days of competition. So actually, as we came around the corner here, there is a dad with a couple of small children that's fishing in this river. Uh, man, I'm glad nobody turned a shot over. They were in a blind spot right there. And if that had hit anybody, not only would it have left quite the mark, it would have knocked them in this river that is just cruising down. So Will and Kel will be the first to go. Will's got probably right about 200. And there is an OB line that circles around the backside of this, uh, of this basket. OB line comes about 25 feet left of the hole and about... 25 deep of the basket as well. He looks like he's going for it, actually. And he lands a couple of feet short, slides out to about 10 feet left. Great shot by Will with the PA2. Kale now, just a little bit shorter, slightly better angle to come in with the hyzer here. A little shorter than he was looking yeah, for. Yeah, he's going to have a little bit of a little bit of meat left on that bone there. Um, if you're going to play the hole conservative like this, that's the shot you need to execute really well. And Kale's left it just a, just a touch longer than he wants, probably 20 to 25. I always get frustrated at myself if I choose to uh, play a hole quote unquote smart and I lay up to a certain spot and then I mess that shot up. It's always pretty aggravating. Paul and Simon are much closer than I was giving them credit for from the box. Simon, yeah, Paul and Simon are both sitting 20 feet or in. It's actually still going to be Kale. And then I think they're just going to flow around the, the group here. And no problems there for Leviska. Like you said, left a little more than he was hoping for. Over at this level, no problems. Right side pocket, but finds its way in for Simon Lazai. Yeah, this is the hole earlier we were talking about when you're asking me about course par. This is the one that some people think is a par three, some people think is a par four. And with the chain still dancing there from Lazat's putt, I think it's two. <laughs> so I think Kale would be of the uh, mindset that this is a par four. He walks by and says that's a ridiculous two.
and Will taking his time here to clean up. We caught up with Will earlier talking about the past champions here at the Glass Blown Open. We'll listen to him and be back with you in a few moments. So as a past champion of the Glass Blown Open, what is your thought process coming into this tournament, being that you didn't win last year, but you have had success in the past? Um, just learning the courses. The courses have changed a, a good good amount. Um, I always want to score really well at Peter Pan. It's changed a lot, probably the most out of the three courses, it seems. And um, it's kind of all based on conditions and attacking the course and playing the percentages. Hey, is that new dating website working out for you? No. I can't find anyone that shares the same interests as me. Hey guys, do you mind if I play through? No, go ahead. I think I'm in love. Thanks guys. So we are here. This is one of our other uh, made-up holes this morning. This is playing uh, hole number 15 on the course. Um, we took out a downhill flick shot, so we were trying somewhat to replace that same idea. It's 292 feet. Um, the best angle is going to be a flick coming in. However, this is a much more guarded green than the traditional hole 16 out here. There are two cedar trees about 20 feet long and short of the basket that have quite a low canopy. I'm looking forward to the Kale Laviska flick. And that was not a shot we thought about <laughs> when we were planning this. Simon goes with the high hyzer clears out the gallery, make sure they're paying attention there long and left. This is Macbeth with a stable Star Destroyer. And really the shot I think he was looking for there. Yeah, he is just a touch long. He has got on the good side of that tree. On the left side of these trees, the branches hang much lower than the right side, so he should have a pretty open 20 to 25 foot putt. going with his orange R or A1 there came up short I mean he is uh, I think I see him leaning against that tree if that's where he's at he's actually only probably 15 or 20 feet out and he'll be able to stretch to the right on that one going with that same M4 that he's thrown in the last couple of holes. He had the angle right. I can't quite tell if he got to the opening. There's a gap in between those two trees. If you stayed to the outside of those trees in short, you're going to have a very low ceiling putt. Those branches are going to come down to about waist high. If he is on the outside, he's going to have to really squat down or take a knee or something. If there was a single disc Kale would play with for the rest of his life, if he was only given one to choose from, it would in fact be that blue M4. 
what uh, what's the thought process going to be if he ever loses that disc? Retire? He just might have to. I know he normally shows up to the World Championships, always finds himself in the top five or top ten at a World Championships. But, yeah, he may just hang it up. I think that blue M4 is that important to him. Okay, yeah, so Paul has indeed uh, gone to the right side. He's got less than 20 feet. Kale has made it just to the edge of the opening. Probably going to have to straddle. Will has tombstoned. He's going to have the most difficult putt. Simon apparently sprinted ahead while we weren't paying attention, got to his disc and threw down so that he's got to tap in three. Will has about 25 feet. There's a tree directly between him and the basket with low-hanging branches on both sides. This would be a super easy pitch up if he wanted the three, but if he's going to try to make it, he's going to have to get creative and then execute on a really, really tight line. The danger here is if he were to hit this tree, there is a downslope that runs for about 45 or 50 feet to the right. He hits the band. He, the, he had to go over a branch about eight feet in front of him, another branch about six feet in front of that, and then get back down, and he wasn't quite able to accomplish that. Kale now with some limbs on his back from 20 feet. That M4 shot paid off able to capitalize here, taking the two. Macbeth inside 20 feet, also looking at a birdie, maybe 22 feet at most. And we'll find two birdies here now. One may second guess or question. Simon is not going with the seemingly obvious forehand shot, especially with as solid of a forehand as he possesses. Seems like that might have been a little bit smarter play for him here. Well, I'm going to guess it's the same theory as he had on the Monkey Island hole, is that he had not played this hole, and so he just went with kind of his go-to, the big hyzer. Because um, the reality is, as long as he didn't hit the first tree on the big hyzer, um, it was a pretty safe shot to get the three. It's just tough to dial in the distance on something you've never done with slopes and trees and all sorts of other things to factor in. Now, Dixon, we may in fact have a whole preview for you. It would be hole number seven of the traditional course. Uh, so a little bit of maneuvering and jogging around here today. But hole, what is typically hole number seven, looks like it measures in at around 330 feet. Hole seven allows the player more room to throw again. Playing across a small valley to a green on the other side, players must be careful of overthrowing off the tee and ending up in the pond behind the green. As players clear the valley, the foliage tightens up back to the flat green that is surrounded by a couple of trees in very close proximity to the basket. Even good throws are often required to stretch some here to get a straight look at the basket. And we've got Macbeth on the tee with a pink Star Destroyer and his, sticks it just short of the pin. His angle is right. He had the right swing, but I bet he's sitting right about uh, 30 feet or so. And a tree is going to be taking up about half of his basket. I believe that was Kale's either his A3 or his D3. And yeah, he came in a little too flat there, landing about 30 left and skipping to about 50 left. Simon's Metal Flake FD3. Looks to be a good play on the right-hand side of the pin. Finished on the right, just short.
Well, now going with a low shot on his H3. He needs that to be a little skippy. Oh, not quite that much. If that had taken just kind of a normal, uh, normal jumping skip, he would have been about 10 left. But that squirted across the ground there. He's going to be probably just inside circle's edge left. The difficult part about this hole, there are three trees uh, kind of triangulating the basket. They're each four feet wide or so, so if you're stuck right behind them, you're going to miss most of the basket as far as your eyesight goes. Um, so you're going to have to do some sort of stretch or reach around the putt uh, in order to, to maneuver those trees out of your way. Uh, Will might be lined right up on one, as well as uh, Paul losing probably half of the basket from his angle. Yeah, I hear a uh, word trickling through the gallery talking about the weather for tomorrow. There was a little bit of rain forecasted. It doesn't appear that's going to happen, but the wind looks like it's going to be up to 30 to 35 miles an hour. Kale now from probably 55 or 60, and he's going to have to come at this basket uh, with quite a hyzer right on the end. The tree that he's trying to avoid is less than five feet from the basket. He's going to have a Sharp eyes are right at the end. He just hangs out to the right side from his angle. Paul now from 25. Slide any putt into the basket and down to the bottom. Will now looks like uh, he's only he's only going to be losing part of the basket for the uh, for the tree. His uh, his kind of normal hyzer approach here uh, should should line him up for a really good angle. He should feel pretty natural with this one. And Simon cleaning up after that fantastic drive. 15, 20 feet. Deuce spot. I think everybody had kind of gotten lulled to sleep. They didn't realize that was a birdie. Simon always talks about how the U.S. spectators aren't as uh, excited about the sweet play that we see out here. But very worthy birdie, birdie there. If you're not perfect, you're not good enough. <laughs> All right, you heard it from Simon Lazat himself. We're going to have a lengthy walk over to the next hole. We're going to stand down for just a few moments. You're watching the first round action right here at the 2016 Glass Blown Open. Ask every top level player if putting practice is important, and you will get a unanimous yes. Introducing the Recruit Basket by Dynamic Discs. This basket is tournament quality at a practice price. It can be put together or taken down in about two minutes and comes with all the necessary hardware and tools. The Recruit Basket has 13 inner and 13 outer strands of zinc coated chains. The rest of the basket is electro first and then powder coated for protection from the natural elements. Weighing in at just over 50 pounds, it's very sturdy, but with the built-in wheel on the base, it's very easy to move. The Recruit Basket is easy to carry in a car's trunk because the pole is made of two parts. It also comes with an in-ground sleeve for a more permanent and secure installation. Get ready for tournaments. Get better. Get the Recruit. Hi, I'm Drew Gibson. You should have featured me on Smashbox TV. Got a big
big order going out today, huh? I sure do. Nice. Hey, Danny. What you working on? Just a new website. It's looking pretty good. Nice. I finally got the baby to sleep. Nice. For me, it's time with my friends. For me, it's a walk in the park. For me, it's my job. Go in. Oh. For me, it's all about the exercise. For me, it fits into my busy lifestyle. For me, it's my passion. For us, it doesn't cost much to play. For me, it's fun. Hole 17 requires players to navigate some early elevation changes to put their discs under the basket. As always, low-hanging foliage aims to complicate that goal and the terrain adds some extra challenge, sloping down and to the right, away from the basket. The basket sits on the side of this slope, giving the players a high likelihood of a putt up or downhill. So Paul, you uh, just finished a playoff uh, a couple days ago, coming into a tournament. How does that sort of tough competition prepare you or does it distract you going into the next tournament? Definitely motivation, really. Um, losing a three-way playoff and then actually I think I was up five strokes at one point in that tournament, which to lose that uh, is definitely motivation to come here to the GBO and then, you know, for the rest of the year. Uh, it really is motivation. So. Uh, sure, bring it back in five, Johnny. So here we are on hole 17. This is a new pin position we're playing today that we made up this morning. The normal uh, pin is a straight shot that is sitting on a left to right down slope. However, the water was up to the bottom of the basket. So we've moved this out onto the flat much closer to the parking lot. It's playing about 250 feet. Clarifying for Paul here of about 250 feet. Paul with a star rock. Paul getting the skip yeah. he was looking for from right to left. Sure. 
Simon going inside of the tree. Uh, that, that biggest tree you can see there, I've seen uh, successful shots just inside or just deep of it, so either way is fine. I'm guessing Simon is probably 15 short left. Kale now with his PA3 trying to go the stand-up shot. He's pin high, 20 to 25. He, he, he'll be able to do something with that. Will now looking at the same shot with the stand-up putter. Same PA3, and Will gives it a rip, standing up right at the basket. Absolutely Park Johnson. Great shot by Will. He saw that Kales fluttered a little bit, so he went ahead and put a good turn on it so he could get it all the way up there. So right now, through holes, our group here, Simon, Paul, and Kale are all tied at eight under par. And... Will is two shots back right now. However, Will looks to be the CTP. Now, all the rest of our players here um, are probably inside the circle. So that CTP might not mean much uh, with this caliber of putting within this group. We've been treated to a very quick and brief round here. Will be quick cleanup on hole 17, but overall this round has moved very efficiently. Of course, some of the shorter pins and changes made it a little bit easier for them on the scoring. So Simon and Will are absolutely parked. Paul was coming in about pin high and found a little patch of concrete and has skipped to about 35 long. Kale sits pin high, 20 feet left. out of his hand Macbeth was not content with his effort he has really been kind of off his putting game I don't I don't know if there's been so many times that I've seen him miss a putt that's uh, makeable for him Kale in for the two uh, now the funny thing about even with Paul being off his putting game he's only one stroke back of uh, what's leading this card right now. And as you mentioned, Lazat and Schusterick less than five feet from the pin. And we're going to take a brief walk over here to hole number 17. Now, Dixon, let's talk about the hole number 18. Or, 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 sorry, hole number 18. And I was already mixing my words thinking about the interchange now as someone plays hole 18 they actually then come back up that same fairway to move off the side uh yeah it's there's a little bit of a walkway but yes if you're 18 and 17 are perpendicular to each other and the 18's fairway goes about 75 feet behind 17's basket so you definitely walk uh in the eyesight of um of somebody playing 17 if you're walking down 18's fairway so 18 in the long position is 355 feet um and the short position is 300 however that 55 feet makes a big difference on this hole because right at the short basket there begins a down slope uh, and the river or the tributary is right behind the long pin um, so that actually plays much tougher uh, when we came out this morning that pin was uh, the the bottom of the basket was actually in the water uh, when we first came out this morning. When we get down there, you're going to see uh, most likely you're going to see a flagged a white flagged OB line in between the two pins. That is actually where the water line was when we started the first group this morning, and I bet the water line is now actually going to be 50 or 60 feet away from where that uh, where that flag line is. However. Since the first group out today played that flag line, every group that plays in this pool will play that flag line. 
Um, now, there will be a different pool out here tomorrow. If the course allows it, we'll pull all of these flags and go back to the regular out-of-bounds back at the water's edge. Um, but for right now, we're playing a, uh, a much shorter hole. The shot here is um, basically if you can throw something on the left-hand side that's just going to peekaboo stand up and then land flat. There is an OB line running all down the left-hand side that is uh, pretty easy to get in if you hyzer out too early. And actually, the uh, the local neighbor here has decided he doesn't want anybody walking into that property. Uh, there's a barbed wire fence about 10 feet into the um, foliage on the left, and he has made that a big pallet fence. Uh, and it wouldn't it wouldn't shock me as he was hanging out over there in the bushes to yell at somebody that came crawling across that pallet fence. Well, as you mentioned, Dixon, they're playing to the shorter pin. However, we do have a whole preview. Sit back and enjoy. We're getting ready for our 18th and final hole of the round. Hole 18 ends the course with one more romp through the trees. Players must aim for an entrance to the woods about 175 feet away from the tee and continue on through the trees to a basket that sits at the end of a clearing, about 355 feet in total distance. While navigating the trees is the main challenge, players must also watch out for the OB Creek that cuts off the back of the hole and makes for a small back of the green. And welcome back again. We are here on our 18th and final hole of the round. Simon Lizotte will have the tee. He's throwing an MD3. to hit something. Oh, not like that. Spotter is coming up and gives the red flag. I think if that had, if that had gone through clean, I think he may have challenged the deep OB line anyway. And Kale with a guess what? MD4. And he has slid. That's going to be a slippery putt about 50 feet putting to a downhill basket going right at the OB line. And Will turns that over. Hey, he gets a little bit of the anti-skip there back to the middle. However, he's going to have that same sort of scary putt with a tree in his way downhill towards the OB. And for the first drive today, we see Paul throwing his McPro Rock 3, catching a tree on that right-hand side. Paul certainly frustrated. This hole is not exactly an easy one to finish up on with the OB, as you mentioned. Well, it's just a, it's really an awkward angle that you're trying to come into the basket. Um, there is a, the first tree that you can hit is on the left-hand side, so you want to stay away from that. However, all of the danger after that is pretty much on the right-hand side as far as trees go. So you've got to throw something that's going to come out of a hyzer angle for the righty and then stand up. However, if you stand up too much, you could cut roll right to the OB line. Uh, you bring trees into play, so it, it really does take a... Uh, a really perfectly touched shot with a, with a great weight on it to, uh, to to get close down there. And Simon is really looking to mess up this round here. He had about 100 feet that really all you can do is play for the three. And he hit a guardian tree that was about 25 short. He kicks over straight left from that. He's going to have about 25 foot putt downhill with an OB line 20 feet behind. Paul now from about 60. Man. 
and Paul missing to the right hand side of the pin. Will now about thirty five. Just sneaking it in over the basket, even with that downward slope. That will definitely make dinner taste better to end with that uh, birdie birdie on the last two holes for Will. And Kale just needed a few more inches to get up and over the edge. He's going to be ending with a par. Simon Lazat has a little bit more work to do. Wide right chain for Lazat. And that is not how you want to finish out your day, of course. Struggling here on the 18th and final hole. Is that visibly disappointed with his finish here? Yeah, he had a great round going and finishes with a circle five on the last hole. Kale will tap in as well as that. And as we said, a somewhat somber Simon Lazat there as he's finishing out. The gallery that is out here is still going to give them a round of applause. They put on a heck of a show for us. Dixon, let's talk a little bit about this round today. It was mostly up, a few downs. What did you see out there? Yeah, I, th I feel like they handled the course well. Um, the the changes that we had to make uh, didn't seem to mess with them too much. Um, they they did fine on on all of the alternate pin positions um, and the new holes. Um, it really is just this is a course that you you feel like you should be shooting 10, 11, 12 down for these guys, and if they come in with a seven or an eight, they always feel like they missed something. They left something on the table. I know Paul's going to be, he's probably going to walk straight to the practice basket to work on his putt. Um, he could have been four or five strokes better probably um, just with his putter, which is normally the thing that he kills everybody with. Um, Kale played a really clean round. He had easy pars or birdies. Uh, he wasn't really ever in trouble. Simon really stumbling here on the last hole. Um, Will was trying to keep pace there. He seemed like he was a couple strokes behind the whole time, but great finish here. Um, I think he may have actually even jumped Simon on that last one. Um, I believe um, that Kale will be uh, the leader of the card, uh, of this particular card, one stroke over Paul, who's probably one stroke over Will, one stroke over Simon, if I have it all right in my head. Uh, that's a lot of numbers, especially with the holes being off by one the entire round. What we do know is that Ricky Wysocki is, in fact, our leader, sitting at 10 under par. So we're going to see a few of these gentlemen joining Ricky Wysocki on our leader card tomorrow. Where are we heading to tomorrow, and what can they expect? We are heading to Jones East, which is one of the best park-style courses I've ever played. Um, it has a um, pretty safe start. You can get a three on the first hole. You probably want to take a two on the second hole. But the story of your round at Jones East is those next eight holes. Seven of them are par fours, lots of OB, lots of opportunity to take strokes or give strokes away. Um, if you go look back at the winners of this tournament of all time, how they did on those holes is going to describe to you how they did in the tournament. You can really give it away right there. And if the prediction is right that the wind is going to be up, especially if it's going to be an east wind, which is what I'm hearing, that's going to make those holes extremely difficult. Um, I could see some wild swings happening on those holes, and with those wild swings come wild emotions. Uh, we could see a pretty interesting round tomorrow. So instead of Jones East, maybe it should be Jones East Wind? Is that what, what if, we might if, see? If that's what's coming. Now, however, I mean, it, it could turn around. It could be Southwest. I could be reading wrong. I could be hearing wrong. Who knows? Um, but if it's an East Wind, that's, that's not a good win for that course.
Well, it's been a great day out here. Of course, this is the opening round at the 2016 Glass Blown Open. This is Dixon Jowers and myself, Terry Miller, the disc golf guy, for our entire staff, for everyone out there at Dynamic Discs, as well as Johnny Villa back on the controls, Joe Height, and Gary to the O. It's been a great day. We'll see you guys tonight at 8.30 p.m. Central. And, of course, you can step inside the Smashbox for our day one wrap-up. We'll see you guys tomorrow. How would you like to raise awareness for disc golf in your area, as well as make a little bit of money? We would like to invite you to participate in the Trilogy Challenge 2016. The Trilogy Challenge is a series of events that takes place all over the world. This year, it's going to be between May the 28th and September the 18th. We're going to provide you as the tournament director with everything that you need to pull off a great event, as well as make your players extremely happy. If you let us know the dates of your events at TrilogyChallenge.com, we will post it on our website. And then about three weeks before your event, we will send you a link where you can order the correct number of players packs with a minimum of 25 being required. As well as the players packs getting shipped out to you, we will also give you prizes for the winners as well as a Trilogy Challenge banner that you can hang at your tournament headquarters. If you go to TrilogyChallenge.com, you can also download flyers that can be posted at your course or your local shop as well as Trilogy branded images that you can post on social media. This year, as an added bonus, if you have over 100 players at your event, we will throw in a Dynamic Disc Marksman basket absolutely free so that you can give as a grand prize to your winner. If you go to TrilogyChallenge.com, you can see the requirements that go along with this particular offer. One thing that tournament directors are usually worried about is that they would order too many players packs. However, if that's a concern of yours this year, we've taken that away from you. If you have more than 10 players packs, we will buy them back from you if you let us know within seven days after the end of the event. We don't want you to be concerned about that. If you go to TrilogyChallenge.com, you can get the answers to all of the questions that you have and register your event. We look forward to you being a part of it again this year.